Good afternoon and welcome to the last in the first series of the EARMA digital sessions. I am Niall, I'm the communications officer with EARMA and I will be the web host for this session this afternoon. So just to explain at the beginning here what the format is, we want you to participate as much as possible throughout. Um, so the way you can do this is in the Zoom window on the screen, at the bottom you will see a black bar and on that black bar is a label labeled Q&A. So in the Q&A section, you can post your questions there throughout and myself and the moderator will be able to go through those and put that to the guest speaker today. So um, participate as much as you can and without further ado, I will hand you over to the moderator today who is Nick Classen and Nick is the Managing Director for EARMA. Take it away, Nick. Hello, hi everybody and welcome to this session on the implementation strategy of Horizon Europe. We have the ideal person with us to uh, say more about this, uh, Ms. Anna Panagopoulou from uh, the Common Implementation Center of uh, DGRTD of the European Commission. Welcome. Um, we um, would have been um, today the first day after the conference where uh, Ms. Panagopoulou would have spoken and uh, delivered as a keynote. Unfortunately, of course, the situation is different in a sense, but we are very, very happy and look on the bright side that we can uh, host her today to say a little bit more about um, Horizon Europe and how that's, uh, how that's all evolving. This is, as Nyla said, the last uh, session in the digital sessions we have put on uh, sort of as a, as a part replacement for the conference. Although, as you know, the conference has been postponed to the end of uh, September and we are following up closely how the situation evolves if we can gather in Oslo um, at that time. Now, um, what I also want to say is that, um, like Niall has said, that uh, we have a Q&A section, so you can ask questions there. We will be first going through the slides and will not interrupt at that moment, but uh, we keep stock of the questions that have the um, sessions. So, Without any further ado, um, I'd like uh, Ms. Anna Panagopoulou to take uh, the floor and I'll start the slides. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you, Nick, for this introduction. I'm very pleased to be with you today. And I would like to, to thank Nick for the invitation and for organizing this uh, a digital seminar on the implementation strategy, Horizon Europe implementation strategy. Uh, I hope uh, all the participants are well and safe and you manage to cope with this uh, uh, particular situation that we all live. And uh, I would like to say that the last, uh, I think it's more than a month uh, that we are living in these uh, particular circumstances, uh, we, we managed to survive thanks to the digital means that we have in uh, in our disposal. And I also believe uh, that uh, probably um, uh, many other events, uh, including the RNI days that we plan to organize also in September, probably they will be organized in a hybrid uh, format, if not, depends on the situation, in a digital format. So for me, it's the first time that I participate to such a big event and I have to give a presentation and it's going to be a test exercise for me. So I would like to apologize if I'm not going to be perfect in this uh, first pilot uh, for me. Um, Horizon Europe program uh, discussions are ongoing, but of course, as you know, the, the discussions of the new MFF are a little bit uh, stuck. So I'm saying that because uh, although we would have liked to be much more advanced on the preparation of the next framework program, in a way we are depending very much on the conclusions of the discussion on the next MFF. And um, it, it, it's going to be quite challenging to, re to reach an agreement, which means that we cannot conclude uh, the policy discussions that we have under Horizon Europe, and we will not be able to start with the program as it would have been foreseen uh, with first calls in 2020. So the plan is that we are going with the first calls in 2021. Um, Nevertheless, when we started to prepare the Horizon Europe uh, uh, proposal and uh, we are thinking how we are going to go with the political discussions, the discussions at the Council of the Parliament, we thought that it would have been extremely important to start thinking about the implementation modalities. And uh, we had already a lot of elements in our hands, the experience of Horizon 2020, 
which was a new way of implementing the framework program with all the digital transformation that we have put in place, the single set of rules and the simplification. We had uh, the contact, the permanent contacts we had with our beneficiaries through the various outreach events that we have done in the member states. We had the discussions we had with the various stakeholders participating in the program. And also we had uh, uh, the um, uh, feedback that we have received from two main important documents, the LAMI report, where it has been clearly recognized that there is a need for more effort on simplification and transparency in particular in the valuation, pro in the valuation process. And we had also the input that we received from the European Court of Auditors. We did an ex a very length and extensive exercise on the experience that the beneficiaries had on the Horizon 2020 implementation, and in particular on the simplification growth. And we received very important recommendations in due time that could be put in the political proposal of the Commission, but also could be taken into consideration on while we are preparing the implementation strategy of Horizon Europe. Uh, if we go now, what is implementation strategy and why we started to do that? Um, actually, because of all these elements, because of our experience, we thought, uh, why not to start preparing an orientation document where we put down in the list of areas that we think that we have to improve or a list of areas where we think we have to start thinking how its implementation would take place because we, there are new novelties in the program. What we want to achieve, we know very well that whatever you put in the policy discussion at the political level, it will not be efficiently, effectively implemented if it is not accompanied by the appropriate implementation framework. And that's why we thought that we have already to start thinking about it. And then if we want to maximize the impact of our money, of our investments and of our program, and if we want to achieve the political expect, uh, objectives, we need already to think how we can best implement the program so we achieve uh, access, easier access to the program, simple implementation, and uh, as much as possible, uh, thinking already how we can demonstrate the impact of the program, which is going to be one of the biggest priorities the next framework period. Um, if we go to the next uh, slide, uh, Nick, uh, I would like to stress this. This is a real co-design co-creation process, which has started with an online co-design exercise. I would even say that we started with the first, uh, the the last simplification workshop that we organized in January of 2019, when Nick also participated, and I was always very happy to collaborate with Nick and Arma in this context, um, we had an online design exercise, co-design exercise that took place uh, during summer 2019 till October. And uh, we have finalized the first implementation strategy at the end of 2019. And I'm very pleased to inform you that today, and in view of this digital uh, workshop, we publish this implementation strategy on our website and my colleagues will send to Nick the link so that at the end of my presentation you can have a quick access to the implementation strategy and you can read it. Pay attention, this implementation strategy is going to be a living document. It's not something that is going to be a final document that you will see, but of course it has to be updated as a living document while we are preparing the program and while at the same time we are updating the timelines and the objectives to be achieved. But why I'm insisting so much that it's a co-creation exercise? Because we start the discussion at the RNI days, that took the first RNI days that took place between the 24th and 26th of September, where Nick also participated, and I assume many of you, and Nick participated in particular in the session of submission and evaluation. We organized consultation events at national and regional level, so we visited all member states to discuss, to listen to them, to discuss with them what are your lessons learned from your participation to the program? What do you think that we have to improve in order to reach your expectations? And it proved that it was a very successful exercise where we, you see the number of countries, the number of visits that we had with a team of four or five colleagues from my directorate in all domains, evaluation, model grant agreement we discussed, uh, uh, audits, uh, dissemination, exploitation, we tackle all the areas. And uh, we took on board the feedback that we received. 
what is the main feedback that we see through these consultations? People that are in general happy with the implementation framework established on Horizon 2020. They agree that it's simpler than in the past. They consider that it's a good example in relation to other programs. And I'm thinking in particular about uh, uh, shared management programs that sometimes create more complexity on the implementation. But they still see that there are areas where we can improve the situation. And of course, the areas that they consider that they are critical and we can do more is in the work programs that sometimes are quite complex and it's not easy to follow and to respond to the calls. It is to, to reduce the complexity of the application forms and the length of the application forms and to take it right from the very beginning is the transparency on the evaluation system, how the applicants, they can receive better feedback. And it rings also a bell in relation to the quality of the experts, whether we could be able to guarantee kind of better quality of experts. Then, in relation to the financial uh, system that we have put in place, more flexibility and more, I would say, more uh, simplicity on the reporting, financial reporting system is something that we have heard of about and less risk for errors. Because of course, as you know, you may implement the fantastic project, but if you don't make it right administratively, if you don't follow the rules in the established in the, in the rules of participation by mistake, the auditors will come and you will have to give up to give up some budget. So the simplicity of the financial system, it was one of the issues that has been highlighted through this discussion. And uh, of course, another aspect that we have uh, heard a lot is how we can make it possible to improve the synergies between the different funding programs, between the funding programs already central, centrally managed by the Commission, but in particular between Horizon Europe program and shared management program structural funds. This is one of the big areas that have been addressed to us and, uh, to us, and how we can improve uh, tools that already exist in order to promote the synergy, such as the seal of excellence, so that it will not be their implementation as complex as it is today, but we will facilitate their, its implementation. So more or less, I would like to say that this is the main elements of feedback that we have received, as well as a lot of questions on how the new um, element, the new priorities of the program are going to impl be implemented. I'm thinking in particular about missions is something completely new, how we are going to put it in place. I'm thinking about the European Innovation Castle, but of course there we have already the pilots that they are running, so we already have some experience on how these pilots, uh, this uh, EIC pilot could uh, uh, be improved its implementation in the future of the Horizon Europe program. And about the simplified cost, a lot of questions about lump sums. We're on the, rest, the first the lump sum pilot. What is the experience? What do we have to expect? Is it a good model or not? Can we use it in the future? So this is the framework of discussion we have. So on this basis, we have established this implementation strategy around four guiding principles. First of all, how we will be able to maximize the impact of the program in the scarcity of the resources that we have now. In the new MFF where impact is going to be one of the cross-cutting priorities and all the programs they will have to be able to demonstrate the impact and, the, and the, how they provide solutions for the citizens and the needs of the society, we need to be able to demonstrate that our program is really delivering an impact. Uh, second, how to is access a greater transparency and further simplification. I think I elaborate already why is that. It is a great demand uh, to improve the evaluation system and increase the transparency of the evaluation system, but also to, to give the possibility to newcomers to be able to participate to the program. The third area that we address, including the implementation trust strategy, is the digital transformation. So how we can use the new tools and means that we have in our disposal in order to enable an effective implementation of the program and also how I would say we can use uh, beyond the digital transformation the possibility of being in contact with the beneficiaries and whatever we improve it will come out from the, the permanent contact and feedback that we receive from the beneficiaries and finally the synergies with the other EU spending programs is a key principle that we would like to address uh, through the implementation strategy. In practice, we, I would like to, 
to, to present the implementation strategy in three main components. The first one is the more, I would say, operational, the program and project life cycle. So through the implementation strategy, it will try to address all the aspects of the program life cycle, from submission and evaluation, preparation of the calls, up to the feedback to policy and data and reporting. So you may see in the first circle, we have all the aspects, work programs, submission and evaluation, model grant agreement, simplified forms of cost, control strategy, dissemination, exploitation, feedback to policy makers, and data and reporting. These are all areas that you, as participants of the program, you are requested to be able to understand in the sense of the calls and the work program, to be able to respond through efficient application and submissions, but you will be able to implement the program with the tools that we are giving you in your disposal, which is the, the, the bottle grant agreement, the reporting obligations, and also how you will be able at the end to disseminate and exploit, exploit the results of your uh, research. So this is the first area we try to see how we can improve the situation and what are the novelties that we're going to bring in the system. The second area, I would go to the third circle, is the, what I call the, the specific cross-cutting considerations, that they are more of policy importance as well, is how we address the European partnerships, how we can make them more efficient, how we can make them more impactful, how we can streamline the way that they're implemented, the second part is the international cooperation. We know very well that our program is open to international cooperation. How we will be able to facilitate the participation of international partners, even those that they don't need our funding, but they just want to partner with us because by joining efforts, we will be able to deliver better results that will address the global needs. And finally, the synergies, I think I spoke already a lot, how we could be more efficient by teaming up and enable investment synergies and political synergies between different programs that we are running under the Commission or at national level. And in between, you have the enabled aspects, because for us, in order to be able to deliver this implementation strategy, we need to have or we need to reinforce and to improve and even to go a step further in our digital transformation. You know very well between FP7 and Horizon, 2010, there was a huge difference on the implementation of the program through full electronic means, how we can do this even better, and how we can use new means that are available, like artificial intelligence, in order to further improve and, and the situation. And the outreach, after the experience we had with the co-creation of the implementation strategy, but also the contacts we have with the benefit, beneficiaries in the framework of advising on the, during the implementation phase of the program, we believe that outreach is one of the most important areas that we need to reinforce. And now, when, after the experience we have with the coronavirus crisis, we believe that we can do it much more efficient through digital meetings and workshops. We can reach many more beneficiaries and potential beneficiaries and applicants, and it's going to be one of the most important areas that we focus as well. Out of this huge list of activities, which I invite all of you to read in the implementation strategy, I would like to focus to some areas that we discussed with Nick that probably are most interested for you today. Work programs, what we expect to do? Uh, to design a simpler and less complex work programs, less prescriptive, but improve their readability. To specify the topics, the expected outcomes. So I think that is going to be very important also for the work that we are going to do internally and to link with a wider impact. Um, therefore, we'll try the topics to be open to a range of the, the, the range of different pathways to achieve them. So in other words, we are going to introduce the notion of the key impact pathways that they will be in the work program and we will try through the, the, the through the implementation of the work program and through your reporting to be able to deliver uh, some information about what is the impact that this program work program has. Then we would like to consider more frequent use of topics so that it will be possible to offer the possibility for submission for more than one year. We have already had experience, for example, from EIC where there are many cutoffs over the year that this gives the possibility to applicants to submit their proposals in various stages, 
If it is appropriate for the specific call or work program, we will try to reinforce this possibility. And finally, what we will try to do, we will try to integrate as much as we can in the funding and ventures portal, uh, information about the institutionalized partnerships, including EIP. We are in discussion now. I don't know how easy it's going to be, but it will be very good to have the full palette of uh, the, the, the tools and the calls and the possibility, funding possibilities existing under the Horizon Europe program under the funding and ventures portal. What I would like to highlight here is that the funding and business portal today, it's not anymore the Horizon 2020 portal, is a portal where you can find information about many uh, centrally managed commission programs and in the future for, for all. So proposal submission and evaluation, how we can address uh, the, the feedback that we receive from the various uh, stakeholders. Less information will be requested in the future proposal template in line with the criteria. We'll try to, to, to consolidate and to streamline the, the proposal evaluation template. And also, we would like to reference to external resources. For example, for example, the introduction of the researcher ID is something that we are thinking to put in place and uh, in order to be able to trace the career of the researcher. The second part is the portfolio-based calls. As you know, in the Horizon proposal, we have a novelty, which is the, the portfolio-based calls for missions and ESC Pathfinder. So there we have to see how in practice we will be able to develop the modalities for the evaluation and the selection of projects that they have to compose a portfolio. And this is going to a little bit uh, uh, diversify from the standard approach that we have up to now, where we follow the, the absolute ranking list, and then we cannot be able, we don't, we are not able to achieve a composition of portfolio of projects that they are necessary in order to implement a specific mission, or it is the, the portfolio project that we need for the implementation of the ESC Pathfinder. Then the right to react. This is a novelty, and uh, it has been used as a rebuttal, a uh, evaluation system in many member states. What we will try to do is to test it under Horizon Europe program in a particular call. And uh, what we would like to see is whether there is a possibility in the stages between the individual assessment of the experts and the consensus report, we give the possibility to the applicants to have some feedback of what is the appreciation of the experts at the individual level without, of course, exposing the names of those experts and to ask them to justify based on the proposals that they have received whether one or the other expert didn't pay attention to what has been submitted to the proposal. So it's a kind of a possibility to defend your proposal before the final decision of the evaluation will take in place. But also based on the experience we had with ERC but also with EIC parts of the program, we would like to go more in using interviews in calls that we believe and face-to-face -face interview could be important for the final selection. And of course, in calls that we know that we will not have uh, an important impact on the time to grant. Finally, many discussions in the council and the parliament about blind evaluation, anonymized first call proposals. We would like to test this. We don't believe that is a bias. Nevertheless, we would like to test the possibility of the blind evaluation at the Horizon Europe. The model grant agreement, um, what it is very important to understand uh, here is that uh, because of the success of the Horizon 2020 program and the way we are working, the Commission decided to use our way of working and our model grant agreement as a basis for a, the development of the corporate model grant agreement for all Commission programs that are centrally managed by the Commission. And we are very much involved with the Central Commission Services, TG Budget and Legal Service to prepare this model grant agreement. Having said that, uh, uh, we, we will have to simplify a little bit more because corporate means that we have to align amongst the others, but at the same time, we will have to respect the specificities of our program. So what we've tried now to prepare, what you will see as Horizon Europe Model Grant Agreement is going to be very much based on what we had in the past. It's going to reflect the Horizon Europe, but it's going to be simplified. And in particular, what I would like to raise here is the area of the personal cost. Because 
we want to get rid of the time seeds. We don't want anymore to go to the complexity of having time seeds, and we would like at corporate level across the commission programs to find a corporate mandatory formula to calculate the actual personal cost, which is going to be much more simple and it's going to be coherent across the different commission programs. Second, what we are going to still have in the new model grant agreement, it could be the concept of the project-based remuneration, which is very much similar to the rules of Horizon Europe. Europe Horizon 2020, and we consider it's a further step of pre-simplification. And then uh, we would like to have a wider reliance on beneficiaries' usual practices for internal invoicing cost. This is something that derives also from the new proposal of Horizon Europe, and we are going to reflect it also in the model grant agreement. And finally, we would like to still have the possibility to have full unit cost based on Marie Curie and a full lump sum based model grant agreement. And uh, of course, we will have to see what is going to be the experience that we have now by the full LAMSA model grant agreement in order to see how far we introduce this tool and mechanism in Horizon Europe. All of you, you are familiar with these simplified forms of cost, and I'm thinking in particular now about uh, the um, uh, LAMSAMs. Uh, and, uh, you know, we have launched first three pilots in 2018 and we continue with new 12 pilots in 2019 in order to be able to assess the effectiveness and the successfulness of the lump sum project uh, cycle across the entire uh, cycle of the program from the submission and evaluation up to the, the interim payments, the payments, interim payments, and the final closure of the project. Where we stand now, we have quite a lot of experience that we have discussed already through seminars with the member states and the NCTs on uh, uh, the evaluation. We don't have a lot of experience on the actual implementation. So what we have promised, we have promised that in Q, I uh, would say three now of 2020, we will organize a workshop where we will be able to share the experience that we have on the implementation of the lump sum pilot. And we are going also to divide guidelines in order to support the decision of using lump sum pilot or not in the upcoming course. So we really believe that we still have to continue to test this concept. And we, we are, I would say, very positive in the outcome that we have so now, up to now, but it's not yet at the level that we can uh, promote new uh, calls on with uh, using the lump sum pilot. So dissemination exploitation, this is an extremely important part. And it's extremely important part because it's very much linked to how we can demonstrate the added value of our program, the impact of our program also for the European citizens, for the market. And the motto of Horizon Europe is from the lab to the market. So how we will be able at the end to exploit the results of our program for the, for the usefulness of the daily life of the citizens, to upscale up in the market, but also how it will be possible to use the results of our program for policy making, for societal needs. What we try to do, and what we have started to do already under Horizon 2020, and we want to improve in Horizon Europe, is first of all, is to improve the guidance on dissemination exploitation to our applicants and beneficiaries. And we do know that sometimes it's very difficult for you to comply with the obligations that we have on dissemination exploitation. And this is an area that we extremely, extremely important for us, and we would like to improve the situation through the, our proposal and the reporting templates. The second area is how we incentivize the beneficiaries to think about exploitation, to take the opportunities about exploitation. And there, I hope that you're familiar that we have launched a first uh, pilot Horizon Impact, uh, uh, Horizon Results Platform, sorry, I want to speak first about the platform, uh, where there is a possibility for you, on the basis of the results that you have, and you think that you would like to advertise them, because you cannot exploit on your own, you can put information on this results platform or your project, that its results, about the eventual uh, stakeholders or demand side that you would like to look at that could exploit the results uh, of your project, and we have established this system already and you can use it. The Horizon Impact Award is another means to incentivize you to, to, to publicize and to exploit the results. 
So we really look at projects that they have made the best effort and they manage to exploit the research results and to use them and to deliver impact. And uh, we have the first uh, release of this prize last year with a lot of success. And we have the second release of this prize again this year. And we hope, we know already that we have more than 300 applications and we hope to, to demonstrate uh, the importance of exploitation of the results and the, the benefit that you also have by exploiting the results of your projects. And uh, finally, what we have put in place and what we will continue to put in place in order to support you in your efforts to exploit the results is uh, the dissemination exploitation boosters. We are going to have very soon a new framework contract to support you with expertise in order to develop your business plus and go to the market strategies or to provide you IPR guidance through the IP boosters. And uh, the, the, the new contract has been evaluated and very soon we are going to have the results and the, 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 the facilities ready for you. If we go to the next slide, um, this is a digital transformation and outreach. All of you, you are familiar with the funding and tenders portal, the feedback that we receive through the discussions and consultation we had, through the, uh, the preparation, the implementation strategies that the funding and tender portal works well, but sometimes it's complex. And it became complex, of course, because now we have all the programs on board. It's not just only about Horizon Europe program. But then it becomes, I would say, one-stop shop, the portal for centrally managed commission program plus procurement. So the benefit of having used this funding and the portal now as the one-stop shop is that by entering yourself in the portal, you will be able to identify which program is the one meet best your needs. And it could be the Horizon Europe, but it could be another program, or it could be intended that you would like better to, to do in order to, to be financed. And also, uh, it will give you the possibility and will give us also the possibility to reinforce the synergies also at programmatic level. So if we have, we anticipate already a synergy between Horizon Europe program and call, and one call at the live project, for example, program, for example, where we have the possibility of sequential funding between the two programs, we can have the possibilities and the way to address it through the funding and tenders portal. But of course, because the complexity is improved, it's increased, we have to improve the functionalities and the searchability. And this is what we will try to do. And what also we will try to do and is to have a multilingual support. So we're already thinking about uh, using multilingualism at the main pages of the, the program and also in the registration process so that we can facilitate and we can demonstrate the openness of the system to everybody, every applicant in the member state. <coughs> the second part that we will try to improve is our engagement with the stakeholders. For us, it's a continuous process. I think now that we have put in place the implementation strategy and while we put in practical implementation, we put the tools and the means in the system, we would like to continue the engagement and the discussion with all the applicants, beneficiaries and stakeholders to see on continuously based how we could be able to, to improve this, the system and the situation. That's why we will very much engage with the national contact points and the member states in order to be able to organize info days, coordination, day, coordination days events, but also events where we will be able to listen to you and to re reply to your questions and to adapt the system to your needs. So for us, it's a continuous process. And at the same vein, the implementation strategy is a living document, uh, which is going to be certainly improved in the years to come. Uh, if we go to the next stage, uh, synergies. This is a particular important aspect of our work, which is still ongoing. Uh, for those that are following the discussions at the council and the parliament, there are many uh, pro, uh, many articles in the legal basis that they are still open in relation to the synergies, cumulative funding, uh, synergies with structural funds, implementation of the seal of excellence. So all these areas are areas that we are going to tackle. We want to simplify and we want to do it in the next six months. We are even considering how we can enable better the synergies between structural funds 
and Horizon Europe, in particular thinking about the possibilities of uh, transfer of budget, but I cannot say more now, but all these areas we are looking at so that will enable them and maximize uh, the impact of EU investments, whether it's shared management, whether it's centrally uh, operated management, in order to deliver the expected impact. And not so, what we'll try to do is through the model grant agreement, which is now corporate, is to facilitate the participation of our beneficiaries in more than one program. My final step uh, of this presentation will be to speak a little bit about missions. I think there were a lot of questions already in the past about how the missions are going to be operated, and there is a very robust uh, governance that we put in place for that, starting from the mission board, and uh, the role of the mission board uh, is basically to advise the European Commission, in which sense, first of all, mission areas have been identified, concrete missions have not been yet identified. And the concrete missions, they have to be specific, they have to be implemented in the next five to seven years, and they have to deliver the results in this time period, and they have to matter for the citizens. This is why one of the main role of the board is the engagement with the citizens and stakeholders. And also one of the main role that they have the mission board is to define the characteristics of the project portfolio for the missions, because as I said, at the end, it's very important to see what are those projects, those, pro those proposals that they are, have been applying for a mission that have to be retained at the very end in order to be able to deliver the expected outcome of these missions. Um, there is a lot of, uh, let's say, novelty in the sense of how flexible we have to be with the implementation of the projects under the, the mission in the sense that uh, it could be possible to adjust the actions or to terminate a specific project if it does not anymore link to the missions. But all these are issues that we still have to, to define in the coming period. So I don't know uh, yet exactly how we are going to implement this, this part. And of course, it's very important how we select the experts that they are going to, to evaluate uh, a mission call where it's not a specific and specific area, but it addresses a, a multi-sectoral type of projects and proposals. And how we will be able to select and brief those experts is going to be extremely important, as well as the evaluation criteria and the weighting that we will use. The framework conditions also will help to achieve the objectives of the mission. This is extremely important. Communication also, policy coordination and synergies. This is something that uh, we have to keep in mind, missions is not just instruments for the framework program. Missions are political initiatives. Framework contract is contributing to missions, but other programs, national investments, have to contribute to the implementation of the missions. So the missions are going beyond the framework program. They are political priorities where we have to align investments in order to achieve them. Therefore, policy coordination and synergies is extremely important. And how we demonstrate the performance and the impact of the synergies is going to be also an extremely important aspect. So these are the areas that uh, the mission board is going to advise the commission. And uh, now we are in the phase where we are receiving the feedback from the mission board and we have to be able to put the exact implementation framework along these areas so that you will be able also to have a clarity on how you can participate to missions and how you will be able to participate to the implementation of the missions. Um, here is a timeline about the steps towards the European, the Horizon Europe Strategic Plan and missions in the work program. As you know, we have an Horizon Europe Strategic Plan, which is going to set the, the multi-annual priorities for, in particular for Pillar 2 of the program for the next four years. We expect that this strategic plan is going to be adopted by the end of the year and it would include the, the priorities on missions and partnerships. So uh, where we stand now, uh, we're in a situation where we are meeting with the mission boards. They have been established. Uh, we have received first mission proposals, 
And we are now in the situation where we try to refine the proposed missions and uh, through the discussions that we have or we will have with the European citizens, which is going to be more challenging, of course, under the circumstances, we were going to come with specific proposals for missions. The, the upcoming RNI days, they're going to take place between the 22nd and the 24th of September. As I said, most probably it's going to be a more virtual uh, or hybrid uh, uh, event that we have to see. And what is important to highlight that there will be a dedicated session on missions and there will be missions events. And also, I would like here to highlight there will be a specific hub on smart implementation and synergies dedicated to exactly what we were discussing today. Um, so is this a, the last slide that we, I think it's the last slide now. Huh? So I talk all about missions. So the, the, the objectives of the missions implementation, I think is very important. And of course, my colleagues, when we have to launch the first mission calls, they explain that. Uh, we need to have a flexibility through the portfolio approach. So in other words, uh, we need to be able to have a coherent set of process, uh, projects from different uh, uh, disciplines to achieve the mission goal. But also, what is very important, the portfolio to include all relevant PRLs. So it is a possibility to go through synergies with pillar one and pillar three, from the lab to the market. I think it is very important to, to, to think about this flexibility which we need in order to deliver the missions. I think I spoke about the monitoring of the KPIs because we have to be able to inform the portfolio adjustment and steering uh, if it is necessary in order to achieve the missions. And uh, the member states, we will be consulted on the portfolio evaluation. So in this respect, the evaluation system that we have put in place is not going to change. The co-creation with citizens, it's fundamental because the, 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 the missions and the results of the missions, they have to be something that the citizens, they're expected for. So we need to listen to them. We need to go close to them and to understand what are the expectations from the research and innovation system. And finally, uh, what is very important, and I said it already, that we go beyond the RNI. So it's not only about Horizon Europe program, it's not only about investments beyond RNI, it has to do with the synergies with national programs and policies at the end. Finally, I would like to say that the missions, uh, the, 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 the calls and the work programs, they will be prepared uh, uh, by the commission services and uh, will be implemented by the agencies that they are going to implement the Horizon Europe program. Uh, yesterday, we have announced in the commission the allocation of uh, our Horizon Europe program to agencies. And uh, just to keep in mind that in the way that we see it, depending on uh, the area of the projects that could be part of the missions, we will be implemented by the different uh, uh, agencies, but the overall coordination, the overall monitoring, the overall guidance on the implementation of the project portfolio will steer by the commission. Um, that's all for this slide, and then we are at the end. Uh, I would like to thank you very much for your attendance. Sorry for the short uh, uh, interruption of my presentation. Um, you can find the implementation strategy, as I said, uh, on uh, our Europa website. Uh, we will share the link with you. My presentation could be shared with you as well, Nick. I have no problem for that. Uh, and I would like to, to, to inform you also on something else. We do a lot of effort uh, in uh, the Commission, in particular in digital research and innovation, to uh, reinforce our, our uh, systems, our funding, in order to be able to address uh, the COVID crisis. In our portal, you can find a platform that we have established on showing uh, what are the activities that we will do in order to address the COVID crisis. We have an action plan with 10 actions discussed with the member states. Many of these actions are related to uh, funding projects or to uh, re rearrange the activities of the projects in order to be able uh, to work in areas that we think they think the project beneficiaries and says they would think will be important to contribute to our effort to address the coronavirus. And uh, we have launched an exercise where we ask project beneficiaries to express their interest if they think that with the ongoing projects, they can rearrange them, reorient them, 
and they can contribute to, to what our effort, our joint effort to address the coronavirus. So if you think that you are in this category of uh, uh, beneficiaries and participants that you have good projects that you could contribute to, to the coronavirus crisis, so we are very happy to accommodate this. The second thing I would like to say is that we do our best to facilitate your needs. We know it's difficult for you to implement the project in the current period. We know it's difficult for you to prepare your proposals. Therefore, we have extended a lot of deadlines for calls, and we also try to give the maximum flexibility that is provided by our uh, financial regulation so that you will be able to implement without problems your projects and to deliver like, the results even if they are delayed. And in our uh, platform that we have put in the Horizon uh, uh, Funding Center portal, you will find a lot of FAQs explaining to you what are the flexibility that we're providing to the project beneficiaries. You have find all the list of deadline of projects that have been extended. And you can also find information about uh, investments that they are put in place either under Horizon 2020 program or under the member states in order to join efforts for our uh, uh, response to the corona crisis. Thank you very much. Thank you to all of you. Yeah. Thank you so much, uh, Ms. Panagopoulou. Uh, we will now be putting on the screen um, the link, uh, also the link that we talked about, about uh, the publication uh, that was uh, what's just um, discussed, will be on the website. So uh, it has already been uh, added. So it's launching today, as I understand. Um, and um, there is then uh, the time for us to start uh, to start the questions. So go to the where you had the link uh, for the uh, for this meeting. You will now also see the link directly to uh, the document. Um, I have a first question that I'd like to pose, uh, Ms. Panagopoulou, and asking how the new um, organization, the new organogram um, uh, of uh, DGRTD, has benefited this process, or how you see that. Uh, first of all, uh, this is an organigram which is uh, it's completely different than the previous one. And uh, for our Director General Jean-Éric Paquet and ourselves to be able to come up with this organigram, it took some months of discussion at all levels. So what is the logic because, behind this organigram? I think you may see that we have uh, uh, Directorate A and B. The Directorate A is the one responsible for all the planning and programming of Horizon Europe program. Directorate B, the Common Implementation Center, has all the responsibility on all the aspects of implementation of the program. And uh, it is not by coincidence that these two directorates are one next to the other. It is because we strongly believe that uh, preparation and policy uh, developments in relation to Horizon Europe program have to be accompanied with effective and efficient implementation. So we, we have a strategic planning exercise that is ongoing, and we have the preparation of the work programs, and in parallel, we have the implementation strategy and putting in place uh, the entire implementation framework that has to be hand by hand. Uh, I would like to pay particular attention that in this uh, organigram, we have a common unit between A and B, and this is the unit on dissemination, exploitation, and data. Why? Because data are important for monitoring the implementation of the program and the projects, uh, and uh, including the financial aspect, but data are very important also because they can be used for evidence-based policy and for demonstrating the impact of the program. So you may see already in the organigram of IDG Research and Innovation, we take particular, give particular importance on how we can use data and results that they are coming from dissemination exploitation for demonstrating the impact of the program and to keep them in the a continuous loop that will fit in the policy, fit in the next programming period. Then you have directorates, uh, the, 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 the health planet and the clean planet, two directorates dealing with the planet. So it is about uh, climate change, it's about uh, the climate boundaries, and these two directorates are those that they are going to actually put in place and work with the mission boards on the various mission areas, but they are the, the directorates that they are also, they will have to work with the other policy DGs in the commission, the relevant transport, energy, environment, etc., in order to ensure that our priorities under the Russian Europe program in the specific clusters that are under these responsibilities 
they are going to deliver the expected policy results in relation to the climate change, for example, or the Green Deal. So as you may see, it's, 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 we don't have any more the thematic approach, but we have a multidisciplinary approach which is addressing very much also the clusters. And, um, and the same goes with the uh, directorates for people and prosperity, where the priority will be on health for people, but also on socioeconomic aspects, and also on the prosperity is very much to the digital and industry area. Now, how all these directorates are co collaborating between them, uh, Directorate A is going to develop the strategic planning and monitoring the priorities at the multi angle scales and on the base of the strategic planning, the commission colleagues uh, in Directorate C, D, E, and F, they are going to prepare the work programs. Then you have the Directorate R and I outreach where I'm acting director currently. And this is the basic science policy uh, directorate, where we have all the aspects about ERA, the aspects related to the reforms of the member states, the semester, but as well as we have open science policy, universities policies, research organization, and research infrastructures. This directorate has to address at political level the research and innovation policy, but at the same time is responsible to prepare the pillar one of the program, but also to prepare the horizontal pillar widening and error. So there also, we have to work very closely with the other directorates, but also with Directorate A, so that the pillar one and the horizontal pillar is complementing what is done under pillar two and strategic planning. And on the top of the organigram, you can also see the IC task force, which is a combination between the work that is done on innovation policy, but also the work that is done in the, in the agencies in order to deliver SMEs and EIC calls. And it's also very much linked to the discussions on pillar three. So you see the whole organigram addresses the, the main pillars of the program and the synergy between all of them needs to be ensured and has to be ensured internally. We have an international organized, international cooperation directorate, which is a cross-cutting priority. And then we have the last directorate of uh, innovative uh, administration, where the, we have all the financial officers that they are ensuring the financial implementation of the projects under the responsibility of future research and innovation. I'm and sorry, then, so, so sorry to cut in, but we have a huge amount of questions. So I'd like okay. uh, if you can, can wrap this up and we, we go to the questions okay. because Good. the time I is limited. I gave the, the <laughs> yes, yes, I think it was a, a, quite, a, a quite good uh, overview. Um, uh, potentially a short question. When are the first Horizon Europe calls expected to be published in 2021? Is there an approximate <laughs> month? Is there an approximate <laughs> month? It depends very much on the MFF. I mean, I cannot say now. Uh, yeah. It really depends on the MFF discussions. Yeah, okay. Uh, something I think you touched upon uh, already, but just to clarify, um, each mission board was to organize extensive citizen engagement across member states to help inform and develop their articulated mission challenge. Given the current situation, has the process slowed down and is the likelihood that we won't see a start of missions in 2021? Is that a possibility? That's not the objective. That's not the objective. And as I said, uh, the commission is going to prepare a communication on missions. So this is the idea to have a communication on missions by the end of the year. And still to have in the first calls of Horizon Europe, the first missions proposals and the first missions calls. But uh, I cannot say more. What I know is that now we're discussing internally how we will be able to engage to the citizens' dialogue despite the circumstances and to be able to, to prepare the first mission calls. Okay. Here, um, I'll, I'll uh, sum this one up uh, a little bit. Um, it's about synergies with structural funds. And I think the core of the question is that it has always been important and a way has been looked to, um, to try to create as much synergy there as possible, which has been debatably not as successful always. Um, what has changed now or what is changing in Horizon Europe to make the, um, the, uh, this a better synergy? 
okay. or more synergies? Possible? First of all, uh, synergies is part of the legal proposals across the MEFET. So all the programs, they have uh, an article in relation to synergies. What is changed now? We, we have to see synergies in three parts, mainly. The first part is what we know, the seal of excellence, and what we try to do there, and we have an agreement already there, is that we simplify the seal of excellence uh, implementation so that we don't have any more to go for the identification or for the parallel evaluation of those proposals that have been evaluated under Horizon Europe uh, program. So the first thing, so we try to simplify this. The second part, which is even more important, is the possibilities to transfer budget. Is it possible, it has been requested by the member state to transfer budget for structural funds under Horizon Europe to implement it centrally and under which conditions? So what we'll try to do, but we are still under discussions on that, is if such a budget on a voluntary basis will be transferred from structural funds under Horizon Europe, then will be spent only and for those countries and regions that they have transferred the budget. But to do so, it means also that uh, the operational programs, the mass materialization programs, they have to identify as priorities areas that they would like to spend the money under Horizon Euro program. So we, have, we need to have a political alignment and then technically to provide the possibility for the transfer of budget. A big question is what happens if this budget, once it's transferred, is not spent under the specific country or the region? And there we have to see whether there is a possibility for a budget transfer back to the country. But this is still an area that we still have to discuss and we are working on that. The third possibility on synergies is whether and we are able to use money that there are uh, shared management, structural funds money, to participate of member states into partnerships. That's the third area that we will try to see how we can facilitate uh, the participation of the synergies between in partnerships between European funds centrally managed, Horizon Europe program, but also national contributions which are coming from shared management, from structural funds. So this is a third area we try to see whether it's possible to do it. And the fourth area has to do with the synergies under teaming and twinning, and there we will try to find ways to simplify and also to simplify through the general exemption block, the, the, the state aid rules, whether we will be able to simplify the procedures also and facilitate and give some incentives through the state aid rules. So this is the palette that we are looking at the synergies between structural funds and Horizon Europe. And also, what we'll try to see, whether it's possible to, to, and, to en engage and ensure the synergies between centrally managed programs also on the sequ sequential side. So in other words, can we have a possibility to ensure investment uh, synergies between two programs at the sequential level, one after the other, but once somebody applies in Horizon Europe program for a project that could be exploited and deployed under another program, we have already the financial assurance that the money the budget is reserved from the other project. So that once the results are there, the person should not have to apply again a second application for another program in order to see whether he can exploit these results. But we have a framework of collaboration already established from the very beginning. That's another area we try to see whether it's possible to, to put it in place. And finally, is the cumulative funding. So <clears throat> now it's possible to use funding coming from different programs to different programs for the same action. In the past, it was not possible because there was always the risk of uh, uh, double funding of the same activities. So now we have the possibility to have two different programs with two different grants to contribute to the same action. And this is a novelty in the next uh, MFA. Thank you so much. Uh, that's uh, that's uh, very, uh, very clear. Uh, I want to go to a question on timesheets um, uh, for Horizon Europe, as you mentioned, that that wouldn't be uh, uh, necessary. Um, and then how this would work in regards to Horizon 2020. And the question, um, um, I assume you will refer then for these personnel costs to the daily, uh, to daily rate in such a case. 
How are we supposed to proceed with the financial reporting of Horizon 2020 project in cases when the project participants are involved both in Horizon 2020 and in Horizon Europe? It's a bit of a technical question. It's very I don't know if question. It's... First of all, we're not thinking about daily rates anymore. Huh? Yeah. We're going to the monthly rate, if I'm not mistaken, but I don't know whether um, uh, Peter Hartwick or is with us who could be able to reply the question. No, I don't think so. But no. maybe because it is a quite technical question, uh, we could be, uh, maybe we can refer to your team by email at a later yes. uh, date. Yes. Um, yeah, okay, super. Um, I look uh, for um, another question, which is a bit outside of what we uh, discussed uh, uh, today, but, but uh, related. Uh, will successful Erasmus University initiatives, whose membership satisfies the basic 3.3 uh, Horizon 2020 consortium criteria, be able to apply as a single entity to Horizon uh, Europe? as was the case with the European Economic Interest Groups. Now, this might also be a, a technical one. I'm not sure if you can respond to this one. Yes, so I, I think we'll refer this one as well. Um, let's see, I think we might be able to um, handle uh, one if more. If I may say only about synergies, because it's linked a little bit to Erasmus. Yeah. Today, we had a webinar in the morning about a first call that we did for European University Alliances. So these are a pilot call under Erasmus. And uh, in the first uh, uh, pilot under Erasmus, they have been established 17 new university alliances, consortia of universities across Europe, in order to promote their reforms at the educational level. So what we did is the first time that we have a, a call for named beneficiaries, actually these 17 selected under Erasmus European Alliance Universities, where we'll try to top up their project through Horizon 2020 in order to be able to promote their reforms in the area of research and innovation. So this is a very clear example of synergies as well. And uh, it's also, I don't, it doesn't reply really the question which is technical, but I just wanted to illustrate that we are thinking also of how we can enhance the participation of beneficiaries under Erasmus program also under Horizon 2020 program. And we hope that in the future we reinforce more this type of activities. Yeah. Okay, excellent. Um, I think we need to be uh, rounding off um, at, this, um, at this time. Uh, one further question maybe, how uh, the missions um, and the calls that will be coming up uh, will be related to the uh, European Green Deal. Could you say anything more about that? So first of all, I would like to, for you to follow the implementation of the first Green Deal go call that we are going to launch in Horizon 2020. So we have a pilot call, the Green Deal call, which is going to be launched by the, I think, October, or October November, somewhere there, in the Q4 of uh, uh, 2020. This is exactly a kind of an illustration of how uh, missions uh, could contribute uh, to big priorities like the Green Deal, for example. So whenever uh, we launch a, a kind of, of a call, which is uh, very much linked to the policy, we always try to, from the very beginning, from the preparation of the work program, for the preparation of the call, to explain what is the linkages with the policy priorities. Yeah. And okay. I think this green call I would call it a pilot. For me, it's a pilot of project portfolio call. It's a pilot of how we will be able, by pulling together funding coming from different parts of Horizon Europe, because this is the case for the Green Call call, uh, to be able to deliver a, a concrete portfolio of projects that contribute to policy priority. Okay, super. Thank you so much for all of the um, explanations. I think we've covered uh, quite a lot. Uh, we have a lot of questions left. Unfortunately, we won't be able to address them at this moment. Those people who feel that their question has not been answered yet, please send it to iarma at iarma.org. We look to bundle them and maybe take, um, uh, we will take um, a contact with uh, the team of Ms. Panagopoulou and see if we can get some of those answered. But also while asking some of those last questions, I, I realized they are quite technical and that might be cause for a, a follow-up session or another invitation to uh, one of the people, uh, one of the other people from the 
implementation center to get more uh, into that. Uh, we were very happy um, and thank you for uh, coming today. Thank you also uh, for um, uh, the presentations in the past by, uh, uh, by DGRTD, Peter Hartwick at our conference last year, uh, much appreciated. So uh, we very much appreciate that the commission looks at IARMA um, as, uh, as a stakeholder and the specific things that we can bring to the table as indeed a, a very technical community in a sense also who has a specific viewpoint um, that we can uh, bring forward which I think is uh, is important especially in implementation and in things as the portal and and the rules model grant agreement and all of that so thank you so much uh, for uh, for all of your time and we look forward to collaborating with you in the future I thank also all of the viewers um, as I announced uh, during that short time when Ms. Panagopoulou was not with us I will stay on for a little while to answer any questions you might have further uh, about IARMA. Um, thank you all. Um, thanks to all of the people from the Commission and we will see you in the future. Thank Bye -bye. you very much. I'm very happy to receive your questions and to reply to them as a follow-up. Okay, thank Super. you. Super. Thank Bye -bye. you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. With that, we leave it for here. Have a nice day.